When we talk about mental illness, when we talk about anxiety and depression and suicide, those are the things that you guys hear a lot in your culture. Those are the things that your generation right now struggles with more than anything. Anxiety, depression, and suicide are the three topics we've covered already. And tonight we're going to call this sermon The Others because there is a whole other world that we don't touch when it comes to mental illness. I was 12 years old. I'll never forget this moment as long as the Lord lets me walk the earth and torment my wife. Um, hopefully it's another 50 years. We'll see. But I remember I was 12 years old. I was in seventh grade and my life was just blah. <laughs> if, if I could just have an expression for my life at this point. You all have heard some of my story with my grandfather passed away when I was in, when I was in second grade in 2002 from cancer. My uncle was diagnosed with cancer in November after my grandfather's death. And literally months after that, he went from having a small knot in his lip to his entire body being covered in this disease. And within five years, we lost him. And when I was 12 years old in seventh grade, I remember that some of my friends at middle school, they were sending these pictures around of these girls. And I was like, what? Well, what is going on? What is this? And then what are you guys sitting? I want to be a part of this because I want to fit in and I want to be cool. And anybody here have a PSP? Anybody ever have one of those? Those may have been a little bit before your time. Some of you did. Well, the PSP was awesome. And it had this thing called Bluetooth. Bluetooth came out when I was in seventh grade. Like that's how old I am. And I remember being 12 years old, seventh grade, middle school, in class. And I received a picture that I had never seen before in my life of a naked woman. And from that moment, I was immediately hooked on something that I shouldn't be hooked on that led me down a road for a long time of mental illness with pornography. I struggled and I struggled and I struggled all because I found something in my life that could get me out of the hell I was living in for just a moment to be an escape. But what I didn't realize I was doing to myself was that I was setting myself up for a disease that I could not overcome on my own. It was a mental illness. It became an addiction. It became something that I allowed to define me. It became something my life became centered around to the point that that's all I thought about. That's all I cared about. And I lived that life for years, and that led me into a deeper and darker period of my time in my life. After my uncle passed, I began dabbling with smoking marijuana. I began drinking alcohol. I was still struggling with this addiction, and I found myself suicidal. I found myself on medication. I found myself in the deep, dark pits of mental illness because I allowed something to come into my life, and it took me over. And that side of mental illness is what we don't talk about because those things have become normal. It's normal to you to hear that word because it's so ingrained into your culture. But what we don't understand is what we normalize soon begins to encapsulate and enslave us. The things that we think are okay, the things that we think are good and healthy escapes from the reality we're living in, most of the time are not. But they are for the moment. And tonight we're not just going to talk about that one where we're going to talk about a lot, but I want us to understand before we finish off with this series that we have covered a lot of ground in the last two weeks. We've covered topics that are deep, that are hard, that are tough. Some of these topics have struck a nerve with some of you in the room to the point that it's brought you to understanding how far into it you are. Some of you in this room have bought into the lie of the depression and the anxiety in your life because of what's happened to you and you've allowed it to define you for so many years and now you're finding freedom from it. Now you're understanding, here's what Jesus has to say about it and I can't tell you how many conversations have been birthed because of this series that we've done. It's incredible what God has been doing but we're not done and he's not done because tonight I want to talk about the others. The things that seem to go untouched, the things that seem to go untalked about, the things that seem to be swept under the rug, nobody wants to talk about it because nobody wants to bring it up. And also, it's become so normal that it's not a problem anymore. When something becomes normal that's a sin, that's a problem. 
And I want us to understand the definition of mental illness and the statistic of mental illness before we even venture into this journey tonight is that a mental illness like we talked about in week one is defined as a wide range of conditions that affect your mood, your thinking, and your behavior. Three facets in your life that affects your mood, your thinking, and the things that you do. Right now, in America, as it stands statistically, one in every five teenagers struggle with some type of mental illness. That means that the however many of you in the room, one in every five of you struggles with something that we've talked about in the last two weeks. And I want to, to preface tonight as we end with some hope in the room, is that it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. That was our mantra in week one, that we're going to talk about these things that are hard, and we're going to talk about what it's like to not be okay, but I want us to understand, and please hear me on this, that it's okay to not be okay right now. Some of you are living in what seems like a hell in your life. Everything's falling apart. You have nothing to grab onto. You're grasping at straws. You're trying to find and feel your way through life. And it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. And tonight we're going to look at some statistics together. And we're going to talk about these ideas of what the other things are that go untalked about. And what they are, we're going to categorize these into three big things. We're going to talk about eating disorders. We're going to talk about... Pornography and premarital sex, because that is a mental illness that is defined as one by the CDC. And we're going to talk about alcoholism and substance abuse. And some of you already think, well, I don't struggle with any of those things. I've never done any of those things. That's great. That's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that. But then there's some of us in the room and some of us that are going to be watching this that have struggled with that. And that maybe you are still struggling with that right now. Maybe you brought it into the room with you tonight. And I want to talk about it because it's our job to give you some truth because we cannot let another generation of students slip through the back doors of the church because we're afraid to talk about tough stuff. And tonight we're going to start off talking about eating disorders and what these statistics represent are not just females because what happens is most of the time when we say eating disorder, we automatically genderize it where we put it off on that's a girl problem. And it's not a guy problem. It's not these statistics are startling. Literally, like I was sitting at my desk mind blown because of some of the stuff that was said. It'll be up on the screen. You can read along with me. It starts and it says, this is the article I read. It says the best known environmental contributor, the thing that contributes to developing eating disorders is the socioculture, which is your culture's idea of thinness, of looking good. Being able to take that selfie and be proud of the first one you take. Walk by the mirror the first time, you look good, you're ready to go. That's where these statistics come from. And right now, 5% of all adolescent girls suffer from anorexia. 15% have some type of eating disorder or eating disorder related behavior. 5 to 20% of teens who have anorexia or an eating disorder will die for reasons relating to that. But here's the one that got me. 10% of all teenagers who struggle with anorexia are men, are guys. I'm going to stop right there for a second because here's what I think happens in our culture. Is that when we genderize things and we put things off on the opposite sex, we are missing an entire group of people that are struggling with the same thing because we're focused on one group and not the other. And tonight, this is not an aim at girls, it's not an aim at guys because we're talking about things that both of us struggle with. It's an aim at us as humans. But 53% of American girls report they are unhappy with their bodies at age 13. And 78% report that they are unhappy with their bodies at the age of 17. That is the general eating disorder statistics in America right now as we sit. That eating disorders are part of your culture. And though we may not even realize it, some of us in the room and some of your friends struggle with this very thing. The second topic that we're going to talk about tonight is pornography. And immediately that thought brings up the fact that that's a guy problem, not a girl problem. 
Again, statistics go to show that it's not just one side, it's both. That nine out of ten boys and six out of ten girls are exposed online before the ages of 18. The first exposure for boys is the age of 12, which was the first time I myself witnessed this disease. 83% of boys and 57% of girls are exposed to group sex online. 69% of boys and 55% of girls are exposed to same-sex intercourse online. 15% of boys and 9% of girls have seen child pornography online. 71% of all teenagers, all teens from the ages of 12 to 17, 18 years old, have done something to hide their online activity from their parents. Or in layman's terms, the lead of their browsing history. 28% of 16 to 17 year olds have unintentionally been exposed to pornography online. And the last one is 20% of 16 year olds and 30% of 17 year olds have received a sext, meaning it's a dirty picture or a dirty text message. And here's the crazy thing about that is that 27% of all teens receive them and there's 15% of just teens sending them. That if we took 100 of you in the room that are from the ages of 12 to 18, 15 of you out of that 100 would be sending stuff provocatively because of an image issue you have deep down in your soul that you're looking for acceptance and you're trying to control this to be someone that you weren't created to be and it's causing the mentals to go all crazy. And before long, you find yourself in a pit of trying to appease the opposite sex because of the way you look and you're willing to do anything you can do and say anything you can say and show any body part you can show because your life is so miserable and you're in the depths and darkness of mental illness that you don't even realize it. And you're looking for a way out. That's what these diseases are. They are ways that we use to get out of a situation, but we don't understand that the way we're going out is actually sucking us back in because the things we're allowing ourselves to be exposed to as a relief are actually things that are imprisoning us and we don't even realize it. And the last topic tonight we're talking about is alcohol and drugs. And I know a lot of you, again, in the room, you're sitting there saying, man, I've never struggled with this. I've never done any of this. And that's okay. But to those of us in the room that have, I want you to hear this. That in 2018, 19% of youth aged 12 to 20 drank alcohol and 12% binge drank in the last 30 days. They did a survey of 30-day trial period with 496 different teenagers all across America, all from different cultural classes. And this is is the statistics. In 2019, 8% of 8th graders, 30% of 12th graders drank in the past 30 days, and 4% of 8th graders and 12% of seniors binge drank in the last two weeks. In 2018 as well, 23.9% of teenagers and adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 had tried drugs. In 2018, there were 4,633 drug overdose deaths amongst teenagers and youths from the ages of 15 to 24. In 2020, this year, Right now, in our time, 47% of all young people had used an illegal drug by the time they graduated from high school. And they broke down the the statistics that 5% were 8th graders, 20% were sophomores, and 24% were seniors. And to end off the research they did in 2018, it said that 1.5% of adolescents, or 358,000 teenagers, both had a substance abuse disorder and a major depressive disorder in the last year. Those with either or were more likely to try drugs and alcohol than those that had not struggled with them. And you said and you say, why are we talking about this tonight? It's simple. I don't want to bring awareness to the issue without getting to the root of the cause. We can talk about these things all day long and these statistics all day long and we can go through numbers, we can look at research, we can listen to story after story after story after story. And while that's good information, I don't want us to just listen to it, but I want us to apply it because here's what's happening that we don't realize. That we are becoming normalized by sin 
And because of that sin, we are seeing more mental illness now than we ever have in the history of America. Did you know that right now, at this very moment, we talked about this last week, every 100 minutes, a student in the grades 9 through 12 commits suicide. Every 100 minutes. And it's due to depression, it's due to anxiety, and it's due to the things that we're talking about because it's real. And it's a part of our culture, it's a part of our DNA as a generation. And maybe some of you tonight are struggling with the very things we're talking about. And I want you to hear me. No matter what you've done, Jesus still loves you. No matter what you've done, what you've watched, what you've what bottle you've put to your lips, what thing you've smoked, what picture you've sent, what risky text you've sent, Jesus still loves you. And tonight I want to end the series on that note. I don't want to end it on talking about all of the negativity of mental illness because here's what happened through the scriptures is that Jesus cared enough about the people he was ministering to to love them hard with real truth, but he seasoned it with grace because he wanted the people he was speaking to to see both sides. That it was out of love that he had those tough conversations because he cared about them and where they were headed with their eternity. He didn't want their lives to be marked by things that are of this world, but he wanted to mark their life for the things that are yet to come in eternity. Jesus had the bigger picture in mind at all times when he encountered people. I can give you story after story after story through the Gospels of people that he healed that was sick. A demon-possessed woman that came and he drove it out of her. A guy that literally couldn't walk for his entire life and he healed him. Somebody that was struggling with grief and depression. He resurrected their heart and their mind. A kid that was dead for literally hours he resurrects. A guy was dead for four days. He heals him and resurrects him. And all through the scriptures, Jesus does miracle after miracle after miracle. And tonight, he can do the same thing in your heart and in your life. But I want us to get to that place that we are willing to listen to what he has to say and not just hear it, but to listen. And there's this guy named Paul. Everybody say Paul. Everybody say Paul. Come on. And this guy named Paul, this, this dude that was in the New Testament, he was the real New Testament OG. Like this dude knew it all. He was literally one of the highest of the highest. He was literally one of the religious leaders. He was legitimately the king of the king. He was the king of the crop. I mean, he was everything that he could ever desire and aspire to be in his life. He was living his life, persecuting the church, killing Christians. And all of a sudden, Jesus interrupts his story while he's on the way to literally arrest Jews. He's on his way, he's walking down the path, and God speaks to him and radically changes his life for the better. But in that moment when God changes his life, we see later on down in a few books that he's developed a thorn. Paul refers to this as a literal thorn. Anybody ever been poked by a thorn? On a rose bush, like you go to grab a pretty rose, and it's like, ah, you get stuck, you start bleeding. Anybody ever like been through a thicket in the woods? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Big old thorns. And he refers to this thing he struggles with as a thorn. Now, we don't know what it is. The Bible never says that. He never admits what it was. Some speculate it was a mental thing. Some speculate it was a physical ailment. Some speculate it was just a metaphor that he used to say, hey, I'm trying to stay humble so I keep myself this way. But what? we don't always talk about is what happened with this thorn. And in this thorn, in his side, as he metaphorically speaks, is that it kept him humble and it affected his life to the point that he was miserable that he begged God to take it from him and God never did. And that may be some of your stories tonight. And you've been battling some mental illness for so many years. You've been battling some depression. You've been battling some anxiety. You've got a terrible home life and you've begged God to fix it and he hasn't yet. And you're questioning why. Why, God, if you're so good and you love me, why don't you fix it? Why don't you make it right? And I'm not here to tell you that I know the answer to that question. But I am here to tell you one thing is that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And I want to take us through this story real quick. We're going to finish in a few minutes but if you got your Bibles, go to the book of 2 Corinthians. You'll see 
like the Gospels. I was just blank for a second. You'll see Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans first, then go to 2 Corinthians. If you don't have it, it'll be on the screen. And we're going to look at these three verses that Paul is writing here. And he says this. Paul speaking. Paul says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. He's talking about his thorn in the side. Three times Paul begged for Jesus to take the thorn away. And each time he who is Jesus said this. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Jesus can work through me. Verse 10, he says, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the insults, the hardships, all the persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I want you to hear this tonight. There's three truths. We always have three truths. If you're taking notes, get them out and get ready because we're going to go quick. Truth number one is that Jesus is greater than your mental illness. That Jesus is greater than the mental illness you struggle with right now. If we go back to last week and we talked about John 16, 33, Jesus is speaking to the disciples as he's about to be led off and crucified. And he says, I have told you all of this, taught you all of this, preached to you for so many years that I have overcome everything. And because of that, you can take heart in me because I've overcome the world. Jesus gives us the promise that he's not only overcome all things, but he's conquered all things. And through him, we have power to overcome that ourselves. Through him and through his death and his resurrection, he gives us the power to overcome the things that we struggle with. They no longer define us. They can no longer defeat us because Jesus has defeated everything in existence. And that may be a huge cloud of you to sort through and a huge thought to think through, but it's simple. Because Jesus overcame, you now overcome through him. Because of what Jesus did for you, you receive the benefit by having the same power in your heart and your soul that raised Jesus from the dead. This is scripture. This isn't me just talking. This is scripture. That Jesus gives us power because he's overcome it. The second truth tonight is that God will use all things for his glory and you're good. God will use all things for his glory and our good. Now what that means is that God doesn't answer every single prayer that we pray. What that simply means is that every situation we encounter, everything we go through always has a purpose. There's never anything that happens in your life or to your life that is without reason. And that's where we all get tripped up. Because our first thing to do when we start struggling or something bad happens is what? We ask the question, why God? Immediately, because that's what we're programmed to do. If God's so good, why does all this bad stuff happen? If God's so good, why does my mom have cancer? If God's so good, why did my dad leave me? If God's so good, why do I have this depression I battle every night? If God loves me and he sent Jesus for me, why do I struggle? And the only answer that we can come up with is found in the book of Romans. And this is Paul writing to the church in, in Rome, he's writing this book and he simply says this in Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That God works all things for the good, not to torment you, not to make you miserable, not to put you under a rock, not to say, hey, you, I don't love you. You, you're going to go through this and figure it out. He says, no, everything in your life that you go through, he's with you because he's working it out for your good. Waymaker, the song we just sang. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. My God, that is who he is. And in that scripture, I believe it, it shows us that the bad things that we see as life altering are the small picture to the grand portrait. That we can only see what happens now. We're only concerned with what's happening today. 
that we can't see what this looks like in three to five years or three to five months or even three to five weeks or days because we're so focused on the now and we want this short-term gain now to get us happy. But what Jesus says is, look, I've worked this out for the rest of your life, dude. I've worked this out for eternity. The small thing you're going through right now that is so big and real to you, the way I look at it is I've got it handled already. You just got to trust me. Because something God revealed to me in the scriptures that the thorn of mental illness is not an attack on you from God. Rather, it's a struggle for you to rely on him more. That God is not attacking you with mental illness. God is not sending bad things to happen in your life. God is not making you miserable. Life happens. Sin is born into this world and that happens. And Jesus sees the bigger picture because every situation is a unique opportunity for him to come in and make your mess a message. To make everything that you're going through good. I can tell you this. I was sitting in the office on Monday watching this video of Haley with Carrie and Candy, her parents, Hannah and, Hannah and Heath's mom and dad. And we were sitting in our conference room talking about what this looks like to struggle with mental illness, what it really looks like for the family, what it looks like as a whole. And they shared their story and they opened up with me and they were in tears watching the video and that guy's getting emotional because it's just so heavy and it's real. And they said there was times in their life that it was dark and they had no answer. And the only thing they knew to do was pray. The only thing that they could muster up the strength to do was to get on their knees and beg God to do something. And he did. But it was in his timing. And so many times we want it fixed now that we have to get over it now, that we need to be better now. And when that doesn't happen, we start blaming God and we put ourselves in a pitfall because we can't trust him to be good because he's not good right now. But let me tell you this, that this scripture proves the point that God is always good because everything you go through right now is going to be used to grow you into somebody that God can use for his glory and for the kingdom. Because if it's not okay now, it's not the end. And if it's not the end, Jesus isn't done with you yet. And if you're still breathing right now, and if you're sitting here right now with a heartbeat and with breath in your lungs, Jesus has a plan for the struggle. But we're called to trust him. And that leads us to the last truth is that I want us to get this tonight as Josh makes his way back up to close us out of this series is that your struggle, your struggle doesn't disqualify you from his love. Hear me again. Your struggle doesn't disqualify you from his love. Because for so many years, that was my attitude towards it. Is that how can God love someone that's such a mess like me? How can God love somebody that's so screwed up and is doing all this junk and doing all the things I'm doing? How can such a good God love me? I was at my wit's end. I had nothing left. I was in the pit of darkness and despair and crying out for help and reaching out for him. And he never reached back. At least I felt that he didn't. But I'll never forget the first time I heard the gospel. The first time I heard the truth about who God is, it's found in Romans 5, 8. And it simply says this, and this is what I think the gospel is in one verse. And it says that God showed his great love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, not while we had sinned, not while we would sin, but while we were still in the middle of the darkest and the deepest and the most negative and the just ever encompassing hell we were in. Jesus died for us. He died for you. And tonight I want you to hear this truth that your mental illness does not disqualify you from God's love. That the thing that you go home with every single night and you battle and you cry and you beg and you 
plead, God, take this from me. You don't love me if I'm struggling. Why am I going through all this crap? I'm depressed. I have anxiety. I want to end it all. I'm trying to escape it by latching on to things that I shouldn't be latching on to. And you're sitting there in your bedroom at the late hours of the evening, tears rolling down your face. Guys and girls, I've been there. Feeling like God is not there. Like you're all alone and nobody knows. And let me tell you the truth tonight. Is that God knows you. He sees you. And he's with you. And it may not feel like it right now. It may feel like you're all alone in the cave and you're dug deep and you can't see light and there's no hope and there's no light. There's no tomorrow. There's no sunshine. It's darkness. I'm encompassed by it. My life is defined by it. It's who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And tonight Jesus says no. I want you to understand something from me. That I died for you. Not because I had to. Not because I was told to. But because I loved you and wanted to. And tonight I want you to hear. If this is the first time you've ever heard this. That there is no other man on this planet that would ever die for you like Jesus did. Because there's never a person that's ever loved you more than he has. And that he does right now. And tonight, some of you came in the room for the last two to three weeks carrying this baggage of sin, this baggage of mental illness, this baggage of anxiety, this whole briefcase full of rocks and you're just walking around with depression and you're walking around defeated by everything and you're literally sitting here and you're begging and you're crying and you're saying, God, where are you? And all the while, He's been right beside you the whole time. Tonight I want you to hear that truth. That Jesus loves you through your struggle. He loves you in your struggle. And he wants to love you out of your struggle. It may not be immediate. It may not happen tonight. It may not happen this week or next week. But it will happen at some point. And when it does, we can look back and say, God, you were there the whole time, but I couldn't see you. Because it takes everything in us to admit where we're at. And when we admit where we're at is where God is working us the most. And tonight, some of you came in this room and that was your story that your mental illness had defined you for years. That you've struggled for so long. And tonight, you don't have to struggle anymore by yourself. Because Jesus is there and you have a community of people here.